We've been talking so far about a lot of the internal components of stress reactions. However, we do know that there are also external or behavioral components to how we respond to stressors in our environments. So the next few slides are actually going to touch on a bunch of these different ways that we can behaviorally cope and respond to different sources of stress. So the first of these is conveniently coping with stress where we see that there are certain active efforts that we can take to try and master, reduce, or tolerate the demands that are placed upon us by our different stressors. And in the sort of societal use of coping, we're usually talking about some kind of healthful behavior, something that is beneficial or that's um, sort of a good approach to help us mitigate stress in a healthy way. In psychology, we don't necessarily assume that healthful component, where this is just good and or bad ways that we try and cope or deal with stress uh, surrounding us. So we'll see that some of these uh, approaches tend to be pretty adaptive, uh, pretty helpful, and some of them might not be as healthy. So what is one of our potential responses? Uh, learned helplessness is actually one of those concepts that can apply here, um, but is actually also discussed in some of the learning literature as well, which is where I first became familiar with it. In its simplest form, learned helplessness just says that an individual starts adopting fairly passive behavior because they've been exposed to lots of unavoidable and aversive events. Basically, if over and over again, you're facing these negative outcomes, regardless of what behaviors you do, you eventually stop trying. So individuals might give up, and we can even frame that as uh, adjusting your goals. So in some scenarios, technically giving up in say an impossible scenario or somewhere where you really can't succeed, Giving up might be a decent approach. You can save yourself all of the effort for something that wouldn't work out in the end. So technically it could be beneficial in some scenarios. Um, it can be framed as sort of this fatalism or resignation where like everything is out of my control. I cannot complete this. You might also see uh, catastrophic thinking that can actually come from some self-blame frameworks where individuals might start thinking, um, you know, I, I am the reason why this isn't working. I'm not smart enough. I'm not trying hard enough. I don't have the skills. Um, but basically negative cycles of uh, I'm now blaming myself. This is my fault um, and so on and so forth. So it can very quickly spiral out of control. And in these situations, it can be fairly damaging and unhealthy uh, simply because you're really, really over emotional and often end up um, sort of overreacting in those situations. So um, you've encountered an inconvenience, a bunch of failures, and you give up. You've gotten to that sort of extreme of I'm done trying. Um, you could also have that moment of the, everything is out of my control. So maybe one of those external loci of control where you're saying that my actions don't matter. So it's in somebody else's hands and maybe coming to terms with that could also be okay. You could come to sort of an acceptance of either I can't do it or my actions really don't matter here. So it's in somebody else's hands. And sometimes that more positive framing could be beneficial. So it isn't necessarily always bad to give up. Uh, it really just depends on the scenario. Um, I will say from the learning experience I have with learned helplessness, when they study learned helplessness, they will find that organisms, uh, when they've experienced over and over again these different aversive, uh, unavoidable events, they stop trying to avoid them. But they have had models where showing them that now certain behaviors will help them avoid that aversive event will actually start the organisms to try and avoid these events again. So you can actually show these organisms a way out of learned helplessness. We can also have things like um, if you have prior experience with there having been a solution before, um, individuals will sort of persist in their attempts for longer. They're less likely to revert to learned helplessness. Uh, and even if they sort of slow their attempts or stop trying to uh, do the normal behaviors, they'll test them every once in a while to see if they're working again yet.
So there are some of those models of learned helplessness in other species that do show that this is something that can be affected by other factors in our environment. It's not just internal components, which is kind of neat and why I mention it here. The next of our behavioral responses here is self-indulgence, where you might have found this behavior within yourselves, where when you are super stressed, when you are facing lots of stressors, you might start acting impulsively or engaging in certain types of behaviors that might actually make you feel better. So things like uh, changes, uh, changes in your eating habits. Are you eating comfort food? Are you eating junk food? Are you eating way more than you really need? Maybe your spending habits have changed. Maybe you're uh, splurging, buying yourself something just to help you feel better in the moment. Um, and some of these behaviors, some of these sort of self-soothing actions can be linked to addiction, um, specifically because a lot of our research on addiction ends up tying into our reward pathway. And our reward pathway is going to activate when certain uh, sort of desired uh, stimuli in our environments uh, tend to occur. So things like eating really good food can light up this reward pathway. And so we would be using that, having these uh, actions we can engage in to try and activate that pathway so that we have more of those feel good neurotransmitters. So we don't feel quite as stressed, quite as bad, um, because of those stressors in our environment. So it's sort of a way to self-soothe and to protect ourselves. And again, it might be okay if your uh, sort of self-indulgence is something like, well, I'm going to have an extra chocolate bar today because uh, it's the end of my exam period and I've been very stressed. But if it's I'm going to repeatedly go on many hundreds of dollars worth of shopping sprees, then maybe that's not so much a good coping mechanism. Uh, so it kind of depends, once again, on the scenario. Since we're talking coping mechanisms, we can also uh, talk about defense mechanisms, where we've talked about these before in our discussion with Freud. And this ties back to things like emotion and motivation and personality. Um, but with our defense mechanisms, these are mainly unconscious actions where we're going to have some kind of distortion um, to our reality, to our perception, something like that, um, to try and handle all of these stressful emotions, all of this internal conflict that's been triggered by stress. So Freud is all about ways that we can kind of hide or redirect these sources of stress and the emotions that they trigger. So we're going to do things like repress. We're never going to think about this again, or we're going to avoid thinking about it. Or maybe we're going to project, we're going to blame somebody else for these feelings. Um, and there's that whole list of different defense mechanisms. And though when you look at it on the surface, a defense mechanism, a distortion of our reality and our perception of the moment, um, even if it is an unconscious thing, could definitely be framed as negative overall. We might not want to have any kind of distortion. However, there can be some adaptive values under certain situations for certain defense mechanisms. So we'll actually see later on that uh, positive framings, looking at things in a more positive light or avoiding thinking of certain negative aspects can actually be a protective factor, meaning that even if we undergo some of these external stressors, the way that we've sort of framed our thoughts internally can reduce the impact that those stressors can have. Um, kind of a neat bit of consideration, but like I said, we'll swing back to this later. Uh, our next uh, topic is constructive coping, and constructive coping is typically framed as fairly healthful efforts that we'll have to try, to try and deal with these stressful events. So constructive in that we're trying to sort of build up a beneficial way of coping, we're trying to work towards a solution. Now, just because we're trying does not mean that we will for sure reach a successful outcome. Um, it's just sort of us trying and striving towards that positive outcome. In this constructive coping approach, um, usually we're going to try and confront our problems directly 
Um, so you can look at things like, well, what task is it that I have to do? What is it that needs to happen to accomplish this? You can look at things like what kinds of resources or options do I have available to me? Um, we can also hopefully have in this situation some relatively realistic appraisals of those resources. So what kinds of skills do I have? How would they help in this situation? We can acknowledge that a little bit of self-deception uh, can be beneficial, just like with the defense mechanisms, a more positive mindset, a more positive framing can technically help our performance. So it's kind of like uh, hype yourself up, make yourself feel like you totally have this, um, but you do really want to stay realistic because if you overestimate your abilities, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure. Another component of this can also involve learning to both rec uh, recognize and regulate some of our disruptive or uh, sort of troublesome emotional reactions when we're under stress. So realizing that, hey, I'm too worked up right now, I need to do something to calm down, or I need to take a few minutes to reorganize my thoughts or to reapproach this problem. So having that ability to look at what's going on and have sort of an objective view of where you're at and how you're reacting can also be really useful. So all of these steps, while fairly similar to stuff we've talked about before, um, definitely applies here as a constructive and more um, sort of hopefully useful way of approaching this problem. So it should give us a way to frame this stressor in a way that we feel like we can handle it, where we have this complete understanding of what's going on, and hopefully we'd be able to approach it in a way that's a lot more likely to lead us to a better outcome. Our next couple of slides here touch on, uh, actually, here we go. There we go. Our next few slides here touch on the concept of burnout, which is currently a buzzword and has a lot of different connotations with how it's used depending on the sources. Um, but burnout is absolutely a thing and you'll find that it might have some parallels back with uh, one of our earlier models when we were looking at that exhaustion stage after we've sort of faced the stressor and sort of hit that we're out of resources component. But for us here, we're talking about burnout as this physical and emotional exhaustion. It tends to also be uh, accompanied with, say, cynicism or that tendency to frame things and think about things in a really negative light. Uh, and it can also come with a lowered sense of self-efficacy, basically starting to doubt your ability to do things. Um, and burnout is something that from this framework is going to come on gradually simply because you are chronically overworked, you are chronically facing more stressors than you can handle in the moment. So too much work or too few resources to handle that level of work. We'll also see that burnout can increase if you're doing lots of work but not receiving recognition for the work that you're putting in. It's things like uh, Lack of control can also relate to that. So you could think of something like uh, if you have a controlling boss who sort of directs all of your actions, they're going to say exactly how much work you do and with which resources, and they might also take some of the credit and recognition for your work, and despite all of that, you have no way of making changes, everything's out of your control, that is the perfect storm of all of those different components of burnout. So this is something that can happen in all sorts of different environments um, because it is just sort of stress, uh, usually work-related stress, um, that occurs all the time in your daily life. And I usually think of the example, as per usual, of students going through a semester where by the end of the semester, you'd probably score fairly high on burnout if your coursework uh, is too much, if you have too much work to do and not enough time, if you don't have the resources to be able to accomplish those tasks, maybe you don't have, uh, say, an understanding of some base concepts, and so you don't have the ability to complete certain tasks. Um, maybe you don't get any kind of recognition, maybe your marks aren't reflecting your work, um, and you feel like they, you have no control over what you do and when you do it. Uh, all of that would be school-related burnout components. 
this can be another one of those parts of why when you finally get a break, say over Christmas or into the summer uh, breaks, um, you can feel very drained and uh, sort of without energy and really struggling to want to motivate yourself to do anything because you're tapping into that both physical and emotional exhaustion. You just can't handle doing anything else. You need to recover. That cynicism of being fairly negative and even having that negative self-view um, that can tie to your self-efficacy, just thinking that I just don't have the capacity for this. I don't have the ability for this. No. And as a flow chart for this information, we can have those uh, sort of components of burnout, things that lead to burnout. We saw the exhaustion and the cynicism and lowered self-efficacy. And some of our consequences on the other side are going to be very similar to facing chronic stress, mainly because this is one possible framing for chronic stress in specific environments. But we see that we have an increased likelihood of physical illness. We have increased uh, time away from work or time away from classes. In workplaces that have very high rates of burnout, you'll actually see very high turnover rates within the staff there. So they'll have people who quit because they are so burnt out that they just want to leave that field. And so seeing high rates of turnover along with some of these stressor uh, indicators can give you that idea that this is a place with lots of burnout. Um, individuals suffering from burnout typically have reduced commitment to their jobs. They're a lot more likely to leave, leading to that turnover. Um, and a lot of that can just come from they no longer feel like they could do this job, or it could be that they no longer care about this job. And that can all tie into reduced productivity. If you don't care about this job or getting this work done, you're probably not going to try very hard to do it. That combined with things like feeling like you physically can't do it um, kind of all feeds together. So a lot of these end up interrelated, um, but this is how some of our models end up framing burnout um, outside of just the way it's used in general uh, sort of to uh, topics in society. And one last sort of little component in this section is uh, PTSD, where post-traumatic stress disorder is one of the sort of disorders that commonly gets brought up in this topic of stress and health, specifically because it's an entire disorder that's related to someone's reaction, someone's behaviors after experiencing a fairly traumatic, um, usually single event, but sometimes chronic events that cause large, large amounts of stress. So post-traumatic, meaning after the trauma has occurred, and that trauma has caused stress that leads to disordered behavior. So we have this enduring psychological disturbance after the individual has experienced a traumatic event or events. And this is often accompanied by prolonged periods of distress. Sometimes we'll see flashbacks, which we can tie into sort of maladaptive types of memories, where you can have these very intense and sometimes completely overwhelming and all-encompassing memories where you almost feel like you're back in the moment. And one of the biggest problems is that they tend to pop up in places and times when you're not necessarily uh, prepared to handle it. Uh, it can come along with higher rates of both depression and anxiety, where um, individuals can feel sort of hopeless and helpless or really worried about having more symptoms or even just the event itself reoccurring. Um, and a lot of this will also then tie into difficulty sleeping, so they'll often have insomnia as well. And of course, PTSD is a very complicated and layered uh, disorder, um, and we'll end up talking about it far more uh, in the next chapter, where we start getting into our psychological disorders and treatment for those disorders. But we typically do at least acknowledge it in this chapter because it's a disorder that starts from stress. So worth mentioning, more to come. Our next section here is going to break down a couple of our sort of more specific effects of stressors on health. So a little bit more of our internal biological stuff, a little bit on some of our different models that are sort of predicting how some of this works a little bit more directly. Um, just a collection of different topics. Um, and the first one of these is our diathesis stress model. 
And this is a model that's applied in a whole bunch of different places. I believe it also comes up once again in our next chapter because our diathesis stress model is looking at um, which factors end up sort of predisposing us to uh, developing a particular disorder, as well as which factors in our environment which stressors in our environment um, may increase or decrease our likelihood of developing a particular disorder. So this is looking at sort of internal predispositions and external stressors in the environment and how the two kind of work together to give us our likelihood of developing a particular disorder or not. Um, so yeah, this will keep coming up, I'm sure. But from our on-slide uh, definition here, we're saying this is a theory that our mental and physical disorders are going to develop from a genetic or biological predisposition for that particular illness. This can also be called a diathesis, and that gets combined with stressful conditions that are going to play a precipitating or facilitating role. Typically, we're going to frame it as uh, an individual is going to have some baseline predisposition, and as we encounter more and more stressors in our environment, we are then going to be more and more likely to develop that particular disorder. So for a couple of different visuals that we can look at here, uh, this is one that I've seen in a couple of different sources where we have our predisposition, so low to high. So this is saying, do you have a family history of this disorder? Do you have genes that give you a high likelihood of developing this disorder? Some kind of underlying biological and or genetic component sets us somewhere along this axis. Then our environment, our stressors, as we go through life, are going to have an influence where the more stress we encounter, the higher risk we are. But if we look at it, someone who's low risk has a low predisposition from their biology, even under very high stress conditions, are very unlikely to develop that disorder. They stay in the blue. Whereas somebody with a high predisposition towards this disorder, um, they're going to be much more likely to manifest or develop that disorder, even with very low amounts of stress. So the higher your uh, sort of predisposition, the larger your diathesis, the more likely that stress is going to cause you or lead you to have this particular disorder. Um, and so it's, yeah, not super specific, no numbers, no quantifiers, um, but you can kind of think of it that way. And if that diagram doesn't quite work for you, I have this one, which I've been using for years at this point, where they were looking at, for this one, uh, predisposition towards alcoholism, where they framed it as our diathesis at the bottom as this uh, amount of predisposition. Our genes are giving us a tendency to become alcoholic, and some people have a higher tendency, and some people have a lower tendency. So. Uh, lots here and very little over here. If they are then exposed to different environmental stressors, um, for this example they're saying, yeah, you were around a lot of friends who drank and you also tended to consume a lot of alcohol in that environment, so there is a high level of stress. So somebody who had lots of stress and a pretty high predisposition, a fairly quant uh, large uh, diathesis, they are much more likely to develop that disorder. Whereas somebody with a much lower predisposition, even if they encounter that same amount of stress, wouldn't hit the threshold required to develop that particular disorder. Um, and so that would be something like, um, that threshold being sort of this line here, this division between our yellow and our blue, but is our combination of our stressor uh, in the environment and our predisposition, is that enough to push us over the line? Yes or no. So not so much the specifics on how we'd calculate this or quantify this directly, um, but a theory just on how we can frame this.
And that idea of a combination of genes and environment uh, influencing our expressed trait, our external phenotype, uh, isn't a surprising concept. We've talked about the nature versus nurture debate and the fact that for most psychological concepts, it's a combination of both. So this isn't anything surprising, just labeled a little bit differently. Now, our next few slides are going to get into some more specifics on, so these are the details that people have found in their studies of stress and illness and what do higher levels of stress tend to correlate with. We've discussed the fact that we see this uh, increase in chronic conditions when people have higher levels of stress, and some of the ones that are most dramatically affected are arthritis and bronchitis and emphysema. So these are things that can be on a fairly large scale. Um, one of the things we need to sort of continue, uh, sorry, consider is that stress itself could be a precursor to those health problems. So we might not see those particular disorders or those particular illnesses or conditions prior to experiencing stress. So something like uh, somebody under high stress conditions might uh, come down with shingles or something like that. Those tend to be very strongly related to stress. But we can also see that if you already have a chronic condition, you can be more prone to flare-ups. So if you already have arthritis or uh, emphysema or any kind of skin problem, that can be uh, sort of complicated or made worse by having high stress uh, scenarios. Um, even things like uh, MS, if you are in remission, a uh, high stress situation can be enough to knock you out of remission and cause a worsening of symptoms. Um, and as we have more and more stressors, as we have sort of higher levels of stress, that risk, that association goes up. So as it gets worse in terms of stress, the uh, sort of effects can get worse as well. And so if we look at, well, what do we observe when somebody is under these high levels of stress, we can see within a 24-hour window, we'll have a decrease in our immune function. So fairly quickly, right off the bat, being in stressful scenarios makes our immune system less functional, less able to, say, get rid of potential threats or viruses or bacteria or whatever it is. Um, we've mentioned that it can worsen pre-existing conditions. This can also be not just sort of external physical types of conditions, but can also be things like internal psychological conditions, where if someone has, say, anxiety or depression, their symptoms might become worse when they're in really high stress scenarios. We also see that our stress hormone, some of those circulating um, indicators telling our systems to ramp up in that long-term fight or flight response, especially cortisol, um, are going to correlate with blocked arteries. So putting strain on our cardiovascular system once again um, and causing reduction in flow. Uh, in the long term, we can start seeing deterioration of some of our subcortical structures. Specifically, our hippocampus tends to not function as efficiently. So you might have found that in really, really high stress scenarios, your memory might not be very reliable. You might completely miss forming memories of certain things when you're really, really stressed. And so this can come with, uh, say, individuals who suffer very acute, um, strong stressors. Say you were a victim of an attack. You might not form any memories of the event at all, which could be due to um, some of the other things going on while you're in such a heightened state of stress. So deterioration to the hippocampus itself, changes in the activity between our hippocampus and the areas of our cortex where we store those memories, um, and that shows differences in sort of storage, but also retrieval. Um, so lots and lots of things implicated there. We can also make a link back to an earlier topic with uh, personality, where our two sort of briefly mentioned personality types for type A versus type B personalities, um, they can have very different responses uh, or different likelihoods of stress. So you might recall, but our type A personalities tend to be very competitive individuals. They tend to focus on trying to be the best, to trying to outcompete others. They tend to be very impatient and want everything done their way right now. 
They tend also to score very high in uh, anger and hostility as part of their wanting to be competitive and the best. And because of all of these sort of very strong, very high pressure uh, qualities, they tend to put themselves in fairly high stress environments. So type A personalities are very likely to be things like doctors or lawyers, where those jobs are, yes, a place where you can be powerful and in charge and in control, but they are also very high stress environments themselves. So you get sort of this interaction between the personality and the environment and things like that. Um, and our type A personalities tend to have a much higher risk of heart disease as compared to our type B personalities, which they tend to be a lot more relaxed and easygoing. They tend to get along with others and they tend to be a lot less aggressive and less competitive than their type A counterparts. But despite the strong differences in how we describe the two personality types, and while yes, there is an increased risk of heart disease for our type A's, it is really as extreme as some people would have anticipated. Where, yeah, that is an elevated likelihood, but it's not a strongly elevated likelihood. If instead of looking at sort of type A overall, if we instead focus on measures of aggression or measures of anger instead, um, and sort of maybe don't split us up into A versus B type personalities, we see that those who are very aggressive tend to be at higher risk of heart disease than those who are less aggressive. And that uh, sort of consideration tends to be a much stronger correlation than if we just look at type A versus type B. So it might not be the personality type itself, but a lot more some of the qualities that get linked to that personality type. And we'll see that uh, sort of different characteristics of different uh, divisions of personality would predispose people to be higher stress or lower stress or um, better or worse affected by stress. So we've mentioned before that neuroticism is another one of those that's often implicated in being uh, fairly prone to negative emotions or being fairly reactive. So those who score high in neuroticism tend to frame things a lot more negatively. They tend to catastrophize, think of things as the worst possible outcome. They also tend to get themselves into stressful situations and then tend to panic and be overreactive about it. So this all comes from a combination of different maladaptive thoughts and behavior patterns, um, and it all then puts them into very stressful situations that they are not well equipped to handle. So those who score high in neuroticism tend also to have very high levels of stress and stress-associated illnesses. Um, so yes, personality can affect our likelihood of experiencing stress and how we experience it. And so if we're seeing this pattern that being in high stress scenarios and being really worked up and pushing really hard and overreacting and being reactive and having negative thought patterns are all bad things that lead to worse outcomes with stress and also higher levels of stress, we shouldn't be, again, surprised that following relaxation techniques or adopting more positive thought, out, uh, thought frameworks um, tend to alleviate some of those uh, negative outcomes. So with our relaxation techniques, we typically start looking at some mindfulness uh, aspects, where mindfulness is characterized by people focusing on the present moment and being a lot more non-judgmental and accepting of different thoughts and feelings. So not so much immediately taking a positive or negative framework, but just looking at things as much as you can as they are. Let's look at facts. Let's look at what's happening as it's happening, but let's not try and pass judgment. Let's not uh, frame it one way or another. And so we can see things like mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, which is um, sort of this technique where we can see enhanced physical health. Um, and that enhanced health 
is going to come from things like reduction in medical uh, symptoms. Uh, we see our pain perception starts changing, where individuals who are using mindfulness as a way of handling stress and are successful in reducing that stress tend to be less, uh, ex uh, they are less likely to experience pain as severely. And this, again, isn't something surprising, and we'll talk about it again when we start discussing depression, but things like depression, where we're prone to negative thought patterns, can actually make certain stimuli far more painful than for someone who doesn't have depression. So that negative framework can make things feel even worse than they really are. We also see a reduction in physical impairments, so people are better able to cope and it tends to then increase their quality of life. So we can sort of quantify this and our success, fin uh, success in employing these different mindfulness techniques, but they tend to be associated with pretty good outcomes. We also see very good outcomes when we look at optimism. Now, in personality, we talked about an optimism to pessimism uh, sort of spectrum or continuum, where some people tend to be more optimistic and others tend to be more pessimistic. It just depends on where you fall. We do find that those who naturally score high on optimism, they tend to have much more positive outlooks. So this is things like, well, everything's gonna work out, even if it's not good now, um, something's going to happen, or everything happens for a reason. Um, whatever it is, you tend to have that feeling of looking on the bright side, glass half full rather than half empty, um, and framing things in the most positive way. So in those cases, people who are optimists have uh, appraisals where they feel less helpless or more in control of their environment or in, of their situation. So in the same scenario, an optimist is feeling more in control and a pessimist would feel a lot more helpless or like control is out of their hands. When we see optimists and they're facing fairly negative life events or strong stressors, they tend to adjust a lot better. They're not going to focus on it or sit and uh, sort of mull it over or pay too much attention for it. They're going to look at, okay, this thing happened and here's how we're going to cope with it. Here's the positives of this negative event and let's move forward. Um, so yeah, they feel less helpless, they are uh, more effective in their appraisals that would lead them to have that less uh, framing of helplessness. And overall, if we look at a bunch of studies with that personality trait of optimism versus pessimism, our optimists tend to have better health, tend to live longer, and tend to have less of those stress responses we've been talking about. Now, it isn't just that either you're born optimistic and have all of these great outcomes or you're born pessimistic and you get all the negatives. You can have sort of a slow, uh, almost like training your mind to think about things a little bit more positively. This can be one of the reasons why someone might choose to speak with a therapist or a counselor, where you can have this adjustment of, yes, I have very negative default thought patterns that can come from, say, childhood, which we'll talk about momentarily, um, but we can start sort of maybe stopping some of those thought patterns and replacing them with something a little bit more healthy, a little bit more optimistic um, to try and alleviate some of those negatives. Um, so yeah, that is a possibility. It's not just all or none. And then as I said, we can start looking at, say, effects of childhood, where childhood stressors, they have been uh, particularly harmful when we start looking at long-lasting effects. And a lot of this ties back to things like, during childhood, we are learning about our environment. We're learning about relationships based on our interactions with our parents and our siblings. We are learning about how our behavior either does or does not have an impact on your environment. And this can lead to some longer term sort of patterns of how we think about things. We've mentioned in our development chapter that children who receive only, say, conditional positive regard might start feeling that they don't have worth unless they do certain things or unless they follow certain directions. 
We could see that if you're in an environment where your parents aren't reliable or aren't there, um, you might start being mistrustful and you might have unhealthy relationships as you get older, which could be much more high stress in the long run. So a lot of those sort of learned behaviors as children end up having long-term effects on how we frame our environments, which can then influence, say, the environments we find ourselves in as adults, and those may be higher or lower stress, depending, um, as well as just the way that we think about those things and how we frame those things, where if you're used to relationships not working out and, you know, your parents didn't uh, get there and do things for us and we've had poor relationships as adults, we might feel like, well, nothing I do is going to make a difference, so I'm more likely to now give up or have more of that defeatist attitude. So we can definitely think about how those long-term effects we've discussed for things earlier uh, can impact stress and coping with stress as adults. Um, Another one of those childhood stressors, or I guess childhood into adolescence, I suppose, um, would be things like social interactions, uh, even at the level of peers. So while I did focus on parents and your home environment, um, your peers can also play a pretty large role where social rejection, um, feeling excluded from a group or being removed from a group or having, say, strong friendships that you rely heavily on taken away from you, those can have a lot of very strong effects. And they're very likely to trigger depression because we rely a lot on that social belongingness. A lot of our identity is tied to the groups that we tend to spend time with. Our identity gets tied up in all of that. And so if we start questioning um, our belongingness because of this kind of rejection, um, it can cause a whole bunch of negative ripples where people start uh, questioning their own identity and their role and uh, how they affect their environment and all of those other things. We did look at the fact that with chronic illness, we are also, we are, sorry, both more likely to develop chronic illnesses if we are under high stress scenarios, but if we already have a chronic illness, high stress scenarios can cause them to be more intense. Um, but with acute illnesses, things that aren't chronic, things that happen, say, once, um, they can end up lasting a lot longer if an individual is stressed. So something like uh, an, if you're having an asthma attack, the outcome of that asthma attack would be worse if the individual was already uh, scoring high in stress. So if your immune system is already, uh, say, affected by this stress, if you're already running out of resources, having something like an asthma attack that your body would need to burn even more resources to recover from, it's going to take you a lot longer. Uh, even if we look at things like, uh, they're talking here about latent viruses. So these are the type of viruses that can exist within our symptom, or sorry, within our systems and not show any kinds of external sort of effects. So they are latent or hiding or dormant. And if we are then under high stress conditions, they might come back. So this is things like maybe when you're really stressed, your cold sores are more likely to flare up. So we can have those pop up. Uh, even things like when you're really stressed, you are more prone to getting sick. So you might find that an illness is going to get you because your immune system is reduced. Or if you are already sick and then you encounter a high stress scenario, that illness can last much longer than it would if you weren't under high stress situations. So there's all sorts of things that can be affected by that. Um, and I have another slide of chronic illness, um, which is probably entirely the exact same stuff we've been talking about, um, where they can be more severe when we're stressed. Um, cardiovascular disease is one of the ones that we talk about a lot in terms of being affected by stress, simply because a lot of our fight or flight uh, sort of system is going to be related to heart rate and how much oxygen we're taking in and how blood circulates. So that being one of the really strongly affected ones is unsurprising. And I use the example of MS being more prone to flare-ups uh, that falls under the umbrella of autoimmune diseases. 
where having uh, high stress scenarios can cause autoimmune disease, uh, diseases to flare up, or it can actually cause them to get worse if you're already uh, showing symptoms. So lots of different things can be affected here. Um, and this point at the bottom was just saying that they've done the sort of a specific study where they were looking at um, basically a list of different childhood experiences that had differing stress scores and adding up those scores and looking at sort of some of our long-term effects where individuals with higher scores on that uh, survey typically have uh, worse symptoms for a whole bunch of different diseases and disorders. But I'm not actually going to go into detail with that. Um, we're just going to keep on learning. Um, so our next little section here starts to get us into the way that we think stress can lead to the, uh, these diseases that we've been talking about. What are some of the mechanisms that end up leading to us having um, sort of problems with our cardiovascular system or flare-ups of our autoimmune diseases? How is stress leading to these? Um, one of the things that can be focused on is chronic inflammation where as we have these prolonged stress responses, we see an increase in our inflammatory proteins circulating throughout our bodies. So these inflammatory proteins are things that naturally exist and circulate so that if we are injured, they can have an inflammatory response. They're going to lead to our tissues uh, sort of killing off any that are already damaged or um, allowing those that are still there and functional to sort of recover. Um, so think of things like uh, if you cut your finger, very quickly that area is going to become red and maybe really tender to the touch. And not just exactly where the cut has existed, but the area around the cut can get red and inflamed, maybe even, even feeling warm to the touch. So these are part of that inflammatory response. So if we have more of these circulating than we should have, we start seeing the potential for more cell death and more tissue damage than what our bodies really need. Basically, we end up being sort of overreactive. So if something happens, instead of having some of our cells left uh, to recover on their own, we might have uh, more cell death or apoptosis, which is the technical term for uh, self-programmed cell death or self-enacted cell death where cells would decide that if they are too damaged to function any longer, um, they would uh, sort of uh, die off. And because of that, as we have more of these cells starting to die off, we're going to need more and more new cells generated to try and replace what we've lost. And so this concept of losing more cells than we should be um, can tie into another one of our concepts with this idea of biological aging. Um, and this is going to tie into the fact that as we get older, we tend to have some uh, changes in what we are likely to develop. So you've probably seen things like as people get older, we are more likely to have uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So people are more likely to develop things like dementia or Alzheimer's disease as they get older. We also see an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, of autoimmune diseases. And one of the biggest theories for why these things and many, many others start to become more and more common as we get older comes from the way that our, uh, the way that our chromosomes are built, where within our chromosomes, we have uh, at the end sort of these protective caps. And these caps are called telomeres. And they are this odd DNA protein complex that sits on the end of our chromosomes. So you right, might remember or be familiar with our chromosomes where uh, this would be our chromosome uh, sort of sitting with our centromere in the middle where we can attach our two duplicates. Sometimes our chromosomes exist as pairs, especially right before our cell divides. But these telomeres at the ends, they don't actually code for something on their own. They are just there as kind of junk to protect the rest of our coding DNA and everything else in between. So they're highlighted here in orange to show us that they are there and how much we have as uh, sort of to begin with. 
as we get older, um, we're going to have our telomeres sort of start to vanish. They start going away as we make more and more copies of our DNA. And as a little bit of a visual on how this works, um, again, probably more detail than you need in terms of mechanisms, but if we think of our DNA as sort of this long stretch, and in the middle we have a bunch of our genes and non-coding DNA and stuff in between. But in order for us to go from a single cell, so one cell is going to split into two cells, to do that, we only have one copy of our entire genome in a single cell. So we need to duplicate every single bit of our DNA to then pass it on into these two new cells. So one of these is going to get the original from this cell and one of them is going to get a copy. And so to do that, we're going to have to use the mechanisms that exist within our cells. So we will have a uh, sort of bit uh, protein of some kind is going to come in, it's going to create this sort of binding location, and from that it's going to say, okay, starting here, we're going to copy all of this. And what we'll notice is that at the very beginning, um, when we're in this area, we're losing a little bit because this thing coming in to bind isn't going to get right to the end. And we're going to lose sort of uh, up to wherever we started making our copy. So this bit goes away. And then the next time we make a copy, we're going to have our sort of new bit come in. We're going to bind here and we're going to copy going over this way. And so now we've lost a little bit more. And so as time goes on, as we make more and more and more copies, we're going to find that we have small bits and pieces left off at the end. And each time that happens, we're not losing tons and tons of bases, we're losing just a small amount of them, but over time it becomes sufficient for these caps, these protective coatings on the end, to get smaller and smaller. And then eventually we lose that protective component where now when we're losing bits and pieces and when we're making those copies, we're now eating into some of our coding DNA. Some of our genes are going to start getting lost. So in this case, we're starting to see that our chromosomes are unstable, they're not as complete as they should be, and when this happens, we might see that our cells undergo apoptosis because they're no longer functioning the way that they should be. So that is one of our mechanisms for how we understand cell aging and the fact that as we get older and older, as more and more of our cells have undergone many, many, many different copying sessions, um, our cells are going to have shorter and shorter chromosomes. So this becomes more and more likely as we get older. And if this loss is happening in parts of our body that are very much affected by, say, high levels of stress from stress responses, like our hearts and our lungs and the areas around our veins, if we're having more and more of those cells dying off because of sort of this high inflammation rate, because of other aspects of stress, then we're going to have more cell death, which ends up accelerating this aging as we're making more copies to replace what we lose. So if we're pushed to have more rapid cell division, we're going to see an acceleration of this biological aging process, which leads to our telomere shortening and going away much faster.